All right, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor, your host, and I'm here today to do a follow-up on an EV. Now, not this electric vehicle, because you've seen lots of these, but this one over here. Yes, this is a follow-up episode for the 2023 Hyundai Ioniq 6. Now, uh, I'll give you some more details about that, but first, before I, I always start my episodes, I wanna thank Hyundai Canada, in this case, the manufacturer, for allowing me the use of this press vehicle for an unprecedented three weeks. Usually, when we get press cars, we get them for a few days or maybe a week, but I was fortunate enough to, to be asked to have this for three weeks, and I'm just a couple days shy of that three weeks, so what I wanted to do was focus this video on my experiences with the vehicle for that amount of time because usually you know you can kind of get a good uh, sense of a vehicle after a few days or a week but three weeks i could really put some driving on and really put the car to the test as far as the overall what's it like to drive day by day use it for running family and errands and work and all this kind of stuff so i'm really thankful for hyundai canada for allowing me the use of this vehicle so what I'm going to do first, though, is I'm going to show you some uh, clips from episode 208, which is the episode that I did in April. That was the first drive video where I went to Vancouver and a bunch of us went for the first the launch of the Onyx 6 here in Canada. So we got to spend a few hours driving it around the Vancouver area. Now, this part of the video that's coming up is going to go through the, the details on it. Um, it's going to go through the design, the exterior, the interior shots, uh, some of my comments about that, and all the specs, of course, the powertrains, the batteries, uh, all the rated ranges there. Then I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to provide some updates because, you know, the Ionic 6 is targeted directly against this car, right? The Tesla Model 3. So I own a Tesla Model 3 as well, so I can give you some good comparisons about you know, my experiences with both and comparing the, the two vehicles and how the Ionic 6 stacks up. So let me insert the first part of the video for the, all the review stuff from the original show, and then I'll come back and I'll continue on later on. So let me start with some thoughts about the design of this vehicle. As you can see by some of the B-roll and shots that I have here, Hyundai has put a lot of thought into the design. The key here is aerodynamics. I mentioned in my LA review video that they call this the streamliner design language. It's a throwback to the, um, to the 30s and the 40s uh, when they were doing designs around that aerodynamic shape of a streamliner uh, locomotive engine or plane, aeroplane at that time. And you can see there's a lot of aerodynamic cues into this. Uh, it's got a 0.22 drag coefficient, so pretty slippery for a production vehicle in that mid-size segment space, uh, which really does, does help with all-electric efficiency. And that's where this vehicle is going to shine um, based on the information that we have and what we're seeing so far that's come out of it. Now, sticking with that design language, of course, one thing that Hyundai started with the Ionic 5 is this pixel type of design language and approach. And as you can see by the turn signals here, you've got all these integrated pixel type lights. You'll see these everywhere, even on the front, there's six pixels indicating the Ionic 6. You'll see a lot of these little Easter eggs of six pixels throughout the different parts of the vehicle. Within even the steering wheel, there's six lights that light up, all, again, designating the Ionic 6 um, uh, model and design language. Now Hyundai talks about a driver oriented focus or a driver focused orientation for this vehicle and it really is so you'll see in some of the interior shots that it really is a driver focused cockpit really good visibility around um, and, and just a good sense of the road and that what you can see out there for the driver and everything is within the controls and all the major uh, things that you need to do with the vehicle or with the driver's reach. Now, one of the other main attributes of the Ionic 6 from Hyundai is the distinctive user experience. This is really a different looking vehicle than they've ever come out with before, of course, as you can see this in the looks. So really designed for a, a pleasant and seamless user experience. And folks, that's something that I'm always kind of trying to drive home is that I don't think you need to really get bogged down with speeds and feeds and, and you know and kilowatt hour efficiencies and this kind of stuff, but have an EV that's easy to use, simple, that has good articulation of information as far as the range and the status of a charge and things like that, but make it easy for users to not have to worry about too much. And I think Hyundai's done a very good job here. Not only does this support multi-fast charging with up to uh, 350 kilowatts, now we don't know the peak rate yet on this. I'm going to guess it's somewhere in the 220, maybe 240 range, but you know what? hopefully we'll get more updated information on the charging curve of this at some point. 
Um, but it does support, you know, up to 350 kilowatt of charging uh, the fast chargers, ultra fast chargers, which will give you a 10 to 80 percent charging time of 18 minutes. And if you follow Hyundai, you know that that's what they continue to message is that 18 minute slot, which uh, if you look at a lot of videos out there of guys that are charging it, that's actually true. They are able to maintain that. And if there's one thing that we found from the Hyundai products is that the range estimation, uh, estimations are really good. They're fairly accurate. So um, they're doing a good job at taking that energy and, and mapping that into what your range is depending on your driving conditions. So good for them. Also, this does support vehicle to load technology. So it gives you up to 1.9 kilowatts of usable load with the adapter that's provided. There's also a plug in the back seat for that. Um, really a low stress environment and we've been driving this around for a few hours in some challenging weather from time to time if we've had some snow going up a little higher here up Cyprus uh, the, at the top it's snowing and here it's raining so we've had all kinds of weather today and it really is a very pleasant experience of a vehicle to drive. All right so I mentioned the charging and here's your charging port at the back here press that button it opens up Nothing too crazy going on here. Your standard J772, your two ports for the CCS Fast with some lights indicating the state of charge and all that kind of stuff. So pretty user friendly, easy to use. From that perspective, you know, the door is easy to open. Again, similar to Ionic 5. Nothing much is changing there as far as some of the functionality goes. Now, this has a similar battery pack at a 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack in here. Uh, again, it's up to 800 volt architecture, so it can multi-switch by, by different charging ports, by different charging power pulls, excuse me, uh, to get you um, different charging rates, as I mentioned earlier. Now, there's a couple of different trim levels. In the States, there is a um, standard range, uh, what they call just a rear-wheel drive standard with a smaller battery pack at 53 kilowatt hours. But here in Canada, we're getting the 77.4s. And what that'll get us is um, on the rear-wheel drive single motor, about 225 horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque. Slap in another motor for the dual motor all-wheel drive, and they're, uh, they're all long-range versions with the 77, as I mentioned, battery pack, giving you 320 horsepower and 446 pound-feet of torque. More than enough, again, folks, as you know, you don't need a ton of power. EVs have that instant torque and that instant pull to get you going. So for some pretty good uh, zero to 60 times, I don't have those times yet, but I'm sure they're gonna be in range to the marketplace and, and to the size of the, and type of vehicle that this is. I did want to mention on the charging that for home charging for level two, this does support up to 11 kilowatts of home charging. So giving you that about seven hours from 10 to 90%, uh, uh, I believe. There is a mobile charger that comes with it that you can use as well. Again, everything is basically very similar to what we're seeing. This is an eGMP based platform. It's very, very well received. Again, the Ionic 5 has won so many awards for what it's doing to the electrification market and what Hyundai has done with that. It's the same platform, same as in the Kia EV6, same as in the Genesis GV60. It's a proven platform now that's really doing quite well, uh, delivering good power, good range, and good charging speeds. So as I continue to walk around the vehicle and talk about it, as you can see, I do really like the, the way that the, the rear section of this vehicle looks. It does have that Porsche-esque look to it, you know, kind of like the throwbacks to some of the 911 uh, vehicles or so with almost that kind of whale tailish uh, thing going on here. Um, I do like the looks of this. This is a very functional rear spoiler as well to help with aerodynamics because this is a hatchback. Um, a bit, sorry, this is a sedan, it's not a hatchback, but we found that there's no need for a rear wiper like there might be on some of the other vehicles that we've discussed. Uh, everything seems to be flowing off this quite nicely um, and the defog and everything system works extremely well, so that's pretty cool. But again, you've got this pixelization going here. You have rear cameras, you have 360 cameras going everywhere. Uh, easy power uh, trunk open, and if I open the trunk, uh, it's a pretty decent size. It's certainly not going to win any awards from cargo space. So for luggage capacity in the in the boot, it's got 11.2 uh, cubic feet. It's about 316 or so liters. Um, and for under the hood, it does have a small frunk. Uh, it's about 0.4 of a cubic feet. Um, and I'll show you what the liter rating is. So it's not huge, but it's the same as we've seen on those other vehicles I mentioned, the Onyx 5, GV60, EV6, of course, from uh, the other brands. It's the same basic uh, frunk system that they use there. Enough to put a charging cable and some other odds and ends in there, but certainly not a Tesla from uh, that type of storage. And just to wrap up on some of this, uh, the 
size specs as well. Again, I mentioned at the top that this is directly going after the Tesla Model 3 market, right? They see that Tesla Model 3 is dominating that market space uh, in that mid-size sedan and they want to go after that. And when you look at the specs, it doesn't appear on this vehicle, but it's actually bigger than the Model 3. Um, it's about four inches uh, of longer wheelbase. Uh, it's about uh, seven inches um, of overall length longer. Uh, it's got about two inches of width and about um, two inches of height on the Model 3 as well. What does that translate to for, for ground clearance? It's just a fraction of an inch a little higher, so pretty well even. Again, I mentioned that uh, 0.22 drag coefficient versus the 0.23 for Model 3. Pretty slippery, but you know, again, something to, to look at and compare. And then when you look at some of the interior room, it does have a bigger interior room size, even though on some cases it doesn't appear to be where um, it has a uh, little bit less headroom in some cases, depending on with or without a sunroof, uh, but, uh, but a good practical leg room sizes, good shoulder room, uh, wider shoulder room and wider hip room, and you can look at all these specs online. I just wanted to point them out as some of the differentiators, because again, they, go, they are going after the Model 3. All right, so let me take you for a quick spin and give you my thoughts about uh, how it drives. So just giving my thoughts on driving the vehicle here. Uh, we're getting some good mixed weather, so I thought I'd take an opportunity while we had some sun to comment. Um, as similar to the Ionic 5, it's a very planted vehicle, the Ionic 6 here. Very nice, quiet driving experience. Um, again, the same platform. I, we didn't look outside, but we think that this is the 20-inch version, 20-inch wheel version. So it's going to add a little bit more road noise to the, for the tire size. Um, and might affect the comfort, but this is a very comfortable vehicle. The suspension is very nice, absorbing the bumps. Not so many potholes here in BC, so we're pretty lucky there. Uh, but just a really nice driving experience. Uh, wind noise is very minimal. We did get up to some highway speeds, and again, because of that aerodynamic streamliner shape that's in the Ionic 6, it does reduce some of the wind noise quite nicely. You can still hear just a tad around the mirrors, but that's standard with, uh, with vehicles. But otherwise, steering is very precise, a very nice handling car. Um, I'm 5'7", really nice, comfy driving position that I could find, comfortable seats. My partner is 6'6", six, six. he was able to find a very nice, comfortable driving experience, even with the, the power uh, moonroof that's in it, he was still able to have a good height and not bump his head into the ceiling, being a tall dude that he is. Um, so that goes to show that Hyundai has really thought about the, the insider ergonomics of the vehicle to be able to fit folks from small to large, small to tall, short to tall, that kind of stuff. So it's good to see. Very similar controls in the Ionic 5, so I don't need to go through all that, but just from an overall driving experience, we've had some nice windy roads, again, some rain on and off. We're climbing in altitude, so right now we're at about, about 20 uh, kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, which is pretty good. Um, considering that we're, we've been going up in altitude a lot. I think we'll probably get under that by the time we get back to downtown Vancouver in our, I think we're doing about a 250 kilometer route here going up and around the area. So very, very nice. Um, comfortable, again, I love the center console. It's got lots of nice to rest your arms. Uh, that European design that they talked about, about putting the power window buttons into the center, taking things off of the door to minimize um, what you see on the door and clean that up. Climate control and everything, again, very similar system as I mentioned in the Onyx 5, so if you're used to that, uh, nice 12.3, I believe they are, or 12.1 inch dual displays here. Uh, all your information is easily accessed. Uh, all right, gonna wrap up with some pricing here. Uh, that's one thing that I was really pleasantly surprised. Last week, Hyundai came out, Canada came out with their pricing schedule for the Ionic 6 and the preferred, they're all the preferred trim level, so they're all the same naming convention there, but there's a couple of models. There's the rear wheel drive. They're all long range again in Canada. We're just getting the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack in our vehicles. So with the rear wheel drive with 18 inch wheels, you can get 581 kilometers of range. That's outstanding. Uh, with that particular model of the rear wheel drive single motor, it'll be $54,999, which is the base MSRP for that. You can go up to the uh, mid-spec trim, which is the uh, preferred uh, all-wheel drive, so just add another motor to it and some other goodies, at, uh, which will reduce your range to 509 kilometers of EPA-rated range, but that's still really good uh, for just a few grand more at $57,999. 
you want the top spec, then you need to go to the all-wheel drive, of course, long range with the ultimate package, and that's a whole slew of goodies that that'll give you. Gives you 20-inch wheels as well. Now, that two-inch difference in the wheels does cut down a lot on the range capabilities. EPA drops to 435 kilometers. I think it'll... All right, so just trying out the uh, lane keep assist and the adaptive cruise control on the Hyundai Ioniq 6 here. Um, I believe this has the... Um, HDA2 system on it because it does do lane changes which I'll show you but I've been right driving on the 407 here for a bit which is a nice highway to practice on you can see it's keeping the lane quite nicely it's keeping the distance of the from the vehicle in front of me I have my cruise set at 110 but we're doing 102 because the guy in front of me that's what he's doing so I do like that now as far as the assistance the lane assistance goes so if I turn the turn signal to change lanes um, and I'm not touching anything. It should automatically just see. There it goes. So I have to. You have to have your hands on the wheel for this action. There we go. But the car basically did it itself. It does not turn off the signal, so you have to do that manually. Um, so it's kind of a, t a little bit of a two-step process where you you do need to have. It, it needs to sense your hand on the wheel for this maneuver, the change of lanes. Um, and but it does do it by itself. It just wants to make sure that you're still able to take control. And I did that maneuver with the signal stock all the way down, not just the partial where you're just indicating a lane change and you're not in, um, using the signal all the way. So I'm going to try it again here just with without doing that, just with the, the short one and see if it changes lanes. And there she goes. So yeah. I, I'm not touching the wheel. It changed the lane there, and and it stopped the signal. Okay, so if you just use the signal turn stock, like you're going to change a lane, not engage it all the way where you physically have to turn it back, then it will shut off for you. It will engage. It does ask you for that prompt to grab the wheel, which you just make sure you do that, and then the the steering itself actually changes the lane for you and then we'll turn the signal off and it keeps that signal engaged throughout the course of that lane change so a little bit different than your basic adaptive cruise control and your lane keep assist functions which do what we're seeing now keep me in the lane keep the distance from the car in front of me stop if the car in front of me stops but they don't read traffic signals or lights or anything like that so it's still a level two autonomy with the addition approaching level three ish will it will do some maneuvers on its own as well but in this case with some help so good system by um, hyundai it's keeping the lanes very nicely it's keeping the distance in a great way i'm going to do one more lane change here so i'm going to just just tap down on the stock so now it's signaling uh, blind spots cleared keep your hands on the wheel as soon as i touch the wheel i feel the car accelerating i'm not touching the wheel now i've changed the lanes and it stops and now it's asking me to put my hand on the wheel so that's pretty good and that was with a, a vehicle that was coming up on my left side here and who's now gawking at the car and running parallel with us but that's fine so it works really good just takes a takes a couple of minutes to get the hang of it and what it does but it's a nice assistance system when you're on long drives so just uh, looking at the uh, ionic 6 trunk space a lot of people may say it's not that big and it's not as big as when you compare it to the Model 3, obviously. But um, just to show you, I've got the seat still folded up. I've got a 10 by 10 tent in there, a portable table, and a bunch of other stuff in there. And I've still got room to even you know, put more stuff in. The portable charger and everything is in there as well. So it's deceiving the trunk space in this. And just to let you know practically, I mean, I've done grocery runs. I've done some stuff in here uh, to buy some stuff. And there's actually quite a lot of room in here. So, you know, it's not as big as maybe some of the others in its class, but it gets the job done. And I was surprised it actually holds all this stuff without having to put the seats down. All right, so I'm here at a, one of my test uh, sites for DC fast charging, the um, premium Toronto Premier Outlet Malls, the Electrified Canada. And I'm at a 350 kilowatt machine. I'm going to put the test, the claim of Hyundai uh, well, a lot of the Hyundai Kia products, of course, that talk about uh, 80%, so 10 to 80% in 18 minutes is what they say. So I'm at 12%. I'm going to charge this to 80, and I'm going to see how long it takes at this 350 kilowatt, uh, 350 kilowatt DC fast charger. So let me get going on that. 
All right, so you can see that I'm at 12% state of charge, showing uh, a range of 48 kilometers. Uh, I've done, oh, let's change the screen here, I've done 360 kilometers. About 80% of that has been highway driving, so I think the range is pretty good for that. So let me plug it in, see what we can get. All right, so I've started my charge here, um, and uh, it's been a few minutes. It, I had to end up phoning Electrify Canada customer assistance because I, I couldn't get this machine going. It kept failing. I ended up starting with Terminal 1, and that you know, we tried several times. Ended up trying Terminal 2, and it worked the first time. So must be a connector issue on here, which they're going to uh, take note of and fix. Uh, but I don't, I'm not sure how this reflection is going to work here, but I'm at 25%. I started at a 12% state of charge. Uh, as you can see, I'm pulling about 170-ish kilowatts of power. It's telling me 16 minutes left until 80%. It's been four minutes right now. So it's fairly on track for that 10 to 80% in 18 minutes. This would be 12 to 80 in 20 minutes. So it's pretty close. Again, that there's dependencies there, obviously. This, the temperature of the battery when you start, the outside conditions. It is about 20 degrees, 21 degrees Celsius right now. Uh, so it's a very nice, comfortable morning. I, I drove the vehicle about 25 kilometers to get to this station. So the battery should be a little warm, probably not as warm as it could have been uh, in a longer drive. Um, I set the station as the route, the destination. So if there is preconditioning, that hopefully it would kick on and start warming the battery. But uh, here we go. So uh, just in five minutes, I went from 12 to 28%. So more than doubled the battery. So that's pretty good. It seems to be flowing at a nice click. I was really kind of hoping to see over 200 kilowatts of uh, peak charging speeds, but I'm gonna leave this. I'm gonna run it right up to 80 and see how long it takes. And uh, let's see what, what that looks like. This is what it shows inside the vehicle. So it does show uh, how many kilowatts you're pulling as well as your current state of charge, which matches the machine in the back. So I have time, hopefully I have time to have my coffee and breakfast here because it's early in the morning on my way to work as I'm doing this charge test. So let's see how it looks. Right, so it peaked uh, just about a minute or so ago at about 178, 179. And then when it hit about 44%, it starts to taper a bit as you can see. Um, we're down to 129 kilowatts, uh, still on pace uh, for the 80 percentile range, which I'll continue to track the time. It's telling me 13 minutes to get to that. So I, obviously we're going to be more than the 18 minutes for the 10 to 80, even though I'm starting at 12% as opposed to 10%, but we're going to let it run its course and see what it does. So 50% state of charge, we're pulling 130 kilowatts, so it's still maintaining a fairly flat um, plateau at this point after coming down from the 178, uh, 170, low 170s. Let's show you what the charging port looks like. As it, obviously, it's got the, uh, the lights there that show 25% increments in the state of charge of the battery. So it's working on getting to 75% right now. It's past 50. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot to see over here. Again, your typical Electrify America slash Electrify Canada screen. Sorry about the glare, but you're getting your information. It's been 14 minutes. We've gone from 12% to 57%. Added 36 kilowatt hours of energy so far. There's my cost. And right now it's holding at 132 kilowatts. So it uh, seems to be holding pretty good. It's only eight minutes left until 80%. I just finished my breakfast. So to wait another five, 10 minutes, it's not a bad deal. Let's see. Now, one thing, I'm not hearing any fans or anything kick in on this Ionic 6 while it's doing this charge at uh, almost 60% now, state of charge. So it's obviously regulating the heat quite well. The, you know, you'll hear fans and stuff kick in when it needs to, but the car knows what it needs to do. So put the trust in that system. All right, so past the 60% state of charge, it's still humming away at around 130, 133 kilowatts. Obviously, the battery wasn't as warm as it could have been, I think, to pull more because I think the charging curve is higher on this. Um, should be should be identical to the Ionic 5, to the Genesis GV60, um, to the Kia EV6, since they're all the same platforms and the same 800 volt architectures. So again, there's dependencies, there's lots of little variables that will impact your actual performance at the fast charger, including what the charger may, may in the background put out. It should 
ideally give the vehicle as much as the vehicle wants uh, at the rated station. So I'm at a 350 kilowatt station. That's its highest output. There's nobody else here, so I'm not sharing any uh, electricity with anybody else. I'm, I should be able to get the whole 350 if the car wants it. So uh, it looks like my battery probably wasn't warm enough to get into the 200s, 200 plus kilowatt range to start yanking power from the station, pulling, requesting power from the station. But it's been a pretty uh, consistent um, exercise right now as I'm approaching passing 65% state of charge. Uh, so let's see how it uh, continues to go into the 70s and 80s. And, yeah. All right, so I've just passed 18 minutes on my timer and I'm at 69% state of charge. Uh, hanging at 134, 135 kilowatts with four minutes remaining to get me to 80. So what does that mean? It's pretty close to the stated 18 minutes for 10 to 80% that Hyundai uh, claims on this vehicle. I would say that the claims are correct, that that's very achievable. I think it had this, the weather been slightly warmer. It's showing 19, so I thought it was about 20 degrees, but it's showing 19 outside. So had the weather probably been a little warmer and the battery been a little warmer, I probably would have yanked this down under 18 minutes. But still, that's pretty good. 70%, 135, four minutes to go. Let's see how it ends. And just in case people ask, I'm just checking the settings and you can see I have, uh, well, for AC, it's at maximum. I had battery conditioning. Well, it wasn't on. Uh, usually that's a winter thing. However, um, so that's probably why I didn't have the best throughput that I could have had here. Um, so I will have to remember that for next time. So that probably would have saved me five minutes here. Everything else seems to be doing okay. So um, I think, again, that's very achievable. Three minutes to go, pushing 70, almost 75%. Almost at 80%, minute to go, I'm pushing the uh, 22 minute mark now for the time that it's been plugged in, just coming up on 22 minutes. So it's gonna be right around 22, 23 minutes. I like it still climbing on the uh, pull, uh, pulling at 138, it's been slowly creeping up to almost 140. All right, so she stopped at 80%. Um, it tapered at the last percentile from 79 to 80 down to about 119, 118 kilowatts but it stopped because I have this set for 80%. So let's go see what the screen says here. As we get out of the vehicle, you can come along and let's have a look. So our charging summary, let's see if we can see that. It's um, put in, well, it said it ended at 79%. It's 80% in the car. Put in 54 and a half kilowatt hours of energy. Took 22 minutes, which was uh, what my timer showed. And then there's my cost of 12 bucks and change. I'll take it for doing what I'm doing. So, again, I would say in summary that this is going to um, adhere to what the claims are for these uh, EGMP vehicles from uh, Hyundai Motor Group, which makes, of course, Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis brands. They're all underpinned by the same platform with these 800 volt architectures, good fast charging. I'll tell you folks. All right, so I'm done with this charge and I hope hope that information was good. As you can see, it's got a pretty, you, you can put all those numbers together that I've been, that I was clipping in and create a charging curve just based on this experience, not obviously from zero to hundred, but from my 12 to 80%. And you can see the charging curve was pretty good. Ramped up, uh, started in the 130s, 120s, 130s, ramped up to the 170s, kind of tapered down to the 130, mid 130s again and stayed there almost to 80%, then, then tapered down to 119, 118 when I hit 80. So I would assume it would continue to probably hang there and then step down a little bit more as you got closer to 100. But you're not gonna do that on a fast charger anyway, you're gonna do that at home. You don't use fast chargers to go much past 80, 85%. Maybe you can get the 90 if you really need to and nobody's waiting, but you're not gonna go to 100. So uh, I think, you know, the, again, the claims are very, very valid. This showed that it does pull it. If you're at the right station with all the conditions there, you are able to achieve those pretty fast charging speeds. And as I mentioned, 22 minutes, I was basically had enough time to eat my breakfast, drink my coffee and do these short little videos. And they're saying, I know I'm done, I'm ready to go. So that's really good. I'm very, very impressed again with, uh, with the South Koreans here and what they're doing to their vehicles. And the charging experience for road tripping is awesome. All right, and 
Hyundai does have an app for their products, and this is the Blue Link app, as you can see here on the screen. They've done a lot of work in improving it, so it's actually pretty usable. I know in speaking to some owners, some of the older uh, app versions weren't very good. This one's pretty good, as you can see. It adds all the basic functionality, giving you detail about your vehicle, allowing you to remote start it, remote uh, climate condition, honk the horn, that kind of stuff. Um, once you, uh, you can even locate your vehicle as well. And again, I'm showing this app in real time, so you can see it's pretty responsive. Uh, it used to lag and lag and lag some of those apps, and you know that's one area that Tesla really excels at. Here you can see uh, some transactions if you've charged and that kind of stuff as well, some history. Now there is some historical data that you can get here, um, looking at some of the battery information and some of the settings, of course, regarding charge management and charging and in scheduling so like most apps and most evs you can schedule when you want to charge during peak uh, hours you can do multiple schedules in this case if you want something for the work days or something different for the weekends so it's pretty intuitive on what you can do um, setting efficiencies as well again if you want to charge during the most uh, efficient times from a cost wise perspective which is usually off peak you can do that again here i'm looking at uh, charging locations i just uh, did a random search Based on where I am, it finds stations that are near. So it's pretty good. You can enter a dealer that you like. It gives you some service reminders again, and you can set those up uh, following the, the dealer maintenance schedule, whatever that is. Uh, I haven't looked into that. So it's got some good, good settings there uh, for that stuff. Even getting into some of the vehicle status, it gives you both an objective view, an object view, excuse me, and then some stats here. And you can dig in a little bit to more of the stats and what's going on functionally if you want to change some of those functions in the status, make sure things are locked up, that kind of thing. Now here back from the main screen, we can look at some more diagnostics and health information for the vehicle. So if you click on some of these, uh, icons, especially some of the ones at the bottom, you can get vehicle health and under the car care, look at diagnostics. Again, everything's reporting normal for the vehicle. Uh, if you want to get more information, you can uh, look for monthly vehicle reports and it will kind of give you a breakdown of what things look like from a diagnostic perspective. It's, again, it's pretty detailed. This uh, goes beyond some of the other apps that the OEMs have as far as a level of detail goes and what you can see in this vehicle. I think that's pretty good. You know, a lot of guys and gals out there want to see information about their vehicle and really kind of wanted to do a lot more with the app than we can uh, without the app, basically. So. So in summary, the app is pretty good. I think over time it will get even better and provide more features and benefits to the owners of the vehicles to allow you to do more. But this is pretty good and this is much improved from the old app. All right, so now that you've seen all the stuff about the Ionic 6 again, if you uh, wanted to see all that stuff, now I'm going to talk about my experiences. Now, first of all, as I mentioned, I've had this for a couple of weeks, almost three weeks. I've managed to put on just over a thousand kilometers on this vehicle, which is great. I've been driving it all over the place, and in fact, 60% of that mileage was highway driving. So usually for me, I don't do a lot of highway driving normally, but the last couple of weeks, I've been zooming around Toronto and to Hamilton and Niagara and different areas, and I've been taking this vehicle all over the place. So I've been fortunate to put some mileage. So about 60% of that mileage is highway and 40% is city. And what that, the bottom line on that thousand kilometers, just over a thousand kilometers is the efficiency. Cause you've, anybody who follows EVs, well, it's most cases want to know what the efficiencies are and there's numbers. Here, I'm gonna focus on kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers because that's kind of what we use in Canada. And you can convert it to your specs, whatever you want. But what I was able to see out of this driving for a couple of weeks doing over a thousand kilometers was about 17.5 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers or 175 watt hours per kilometer if you do the math there, which is pretty good. Now, again, this is an aero car, right? It's got that streamliner design that I talked about earlier. It's got a 0.22 drag coefficient, just a little bit better than the Model 3. So it should be pretty good from an efficiencies. Now, in my Model 3, I get right now in these temperatures, and, I, and this is, of course, in nice warm temperatures, we've av averaged about 25 degrees C over the last couple of weeks, and it's get, you know, hot days, cool days, but about that average. My Model 3, I can get about 120 to 140 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So very, very efficient, but that's on 18 inch tires. This is running, this is the premium, right? With the 20 inch uh, wheels and all wheel drive. Of course, my Model 3 is all wheel drive, but on 20 inch tires, which are a little stickier, a little wider, more friction, and I'm getting that kind of efficiency. So I would guess that if I had the 18s, 
uh, that you can get in the lower spec models, um, you would probably get pretty better efficiency than 17 and a half in these temperatures. So I think that it's doing pretty good. I had a, I saw an efficiency as, uh, as high, as far as a negative, as 18.1, and the best efficiency that I was able to see over this period was 15.9. So I was able to get into the 15s in just city round, round town driving. So I thought that that was pretty good. Now, when we talk about range numbers, we know that the Model 3 is over 500 kilometers range, over 300 mile range. Hyundai touts very, very similar ranges, especially for the single motor uh, um, with the, the big battery pack, of course, which is the most range that you'll get on this. Um, EPA rating on this is 435 kilometers or 270 miles. I was able to get um, on average uh, as high as 489 kilometers of, of range showing at 100% state of charge and as low as 438 kilometers on 100% state of charge. So I'm able to beat the EPA numbers and typically that's what we see EVs do anyway. EPAs are a pretty good guide, but most EVs, especially when you drive them normally, I've been driving this in eco mode all the time, using one pedal driving to get max regen and it's been, been driving very, very well. It's a seamless experience. So. I would say from an overall efficiency, this is very, very comparable to the Model 3 if you just strip around the numbers in, in the driving that I've done for almost three weeks. I would say this is right on par with the Model 3, maybe slightly lower, but really, really good because the Model 3 is sets the benchmark for efficiencies, right? We all know that. So they've done. Now I wanna talk about some of the pros and cons that I've kind of picked up over this uh, few weeks of driving comparing the Ionic 6 to the Model 3 as far as pros and cons go. Now, if we look at the, the total package of the Ionic 6 from a physical dimensions and an interior dimension size, exterior and interior, it's longer wheelbase, it's got a longer length than the Model 3, it's a little wider than the Model 3 and a little higher than the Model 3. So that means it's got a bit more interior space. That's pretty good. That is a bit of an advantage on the Ionic 6. Um, we know the Model 3, as I mentioned, is the king of the efficiency and the range segment in this class. It really is the top, so that's certainly a positive. Now, you just saw, um, you know, in, in some of the video earlier that I did the fast charging. So they both have fast charging. Model 3 has really good fast charging through the supercharger network and others. Onyx 6 is right there at par. So on a road trip, both of these would perform very, very well. Um, you know, looks, looks is very subjective, right? Uh, people see Tesla, they know it, they recognize the brand now. It's, it's, it's a really an iconic brand in the EV market space. So it's definitely a plus for Tesla having those unique looks and characteristics that only Tesla has and everybody can recognize it. However, in the Ionic 6, I've had lots of heads turned. I did a few EV events where people came up and said, this is a gorgeous car. I really love the looks. I love that streamliner look. So I would say in the looks department, they are both really well up there. And, you know, uh, Ionix, uh, Hyundai's done a fantastic job in the design of this. You know, you've seen the commercials, we make wah. Well, I say they make wow, because this car is wow. It's just awesome. And that, that wah concept, they've certainly poured their heart and soul into this vehicle. And they've done a fantastic job and people are taking notice of that. Now on the technology side, the technology in the Onyx 6 is good, it's fair, it's okay. It's really hard to beat Tesla though. Tesla's really grasped that whole tech feel and we all know that. Half the time the Tesla products are more like computers on wheels than they are cars. So they really reign when it comes to the tech and the over there updates, right? They're the ones that really started the whole trend and they, they use those updates extremely well and they're very efficient at doing those. Now a lot of OEMs are catching up, Hyundai, of course is part of that mix and this is the first vehicle in the Onyx family to actually support over-the-air updates so they will make this car better add more features and tweak it and make it better over time through over-the-air over the updates similar to Tesla so they will get to that par Tesla still of course leads in that department now, one thing I noticed, I like to listen to my 80s, of course. Uh, that's what I'm stuck in that decade. And I can tell you that the Tesla sound system, especially the premium sound system, which is what I have in my Model 3, are, they're a fantastic sound system. For an unnamed system, they, the sound is, is at, up there with, one, with the top beamers and, and Benzes and stuff of the world. They have a very good sound system. Now, the Onyx sound system, this one, the premium is a Bose system. It's good but not as good as the Tesla. So I would certainly rank 
um, the Hyundai in that department. Now, of course, when I'm, if I'm talking about infotainment and sound systems, I'd be neg negligent if I didn't mention that. Of course, Hyundai Ioniq 6 does support Apple CarPlay and Google Android, and that's one thing Tesla doesn't. So, so I mentioned the physical aspects of it. When you look at storage, you know, the Ioniq 6 does have a smaller trunk. It's not as big as the Model 3, and of course, a very small front. You can put a couple small things in there, but that's about it. Tesla really has, has made that space, you know. And for some people, the front is very important. And for others, we've never had it for 100 years, so who cares, right? So it's really up to you on what you think of that. But there is a small front element. The trunk is pretty good. Uh, I think as I showed you in the video, I was able to pack a lot of stuff in there. So it's deceiving on how that trunk is. It looks smaller than it is, and the seats do fold down, so you can get some good room. But Tesla certainly wins in the storage compartment. Now, I want to talk about something that's very important and near to dear to me is the ride quality. This car... I describe it as silky, smooth, and suave. This has the three S's. This is just has been such a joy to drive around for the last few weeks. It is an effortless driving experience. It feels like you're just gliding on the roadway. It really is effortless. It's so quiet. It manages the bumps and the, the, the rotten streets. I was in Hamilton and they have some bad roads out there last week. And this thing just cruises right over them. It's not this Cadillac floating feel. It's a very competent way of absorbing the, bump, the bumps and the road uh, hazards that come up upon you and keeping the cabin in a fairly a nice manner and keeping the occupants comfortable. So they've done a fantastic job for, you know, a coilover setup, right? This isn't air, this isn't, doesn't have electronic dampening. This is just a setup package, but they've done a really good job. And even with the 20 inch tires, it's still more comfortable than my Model 3 with 18 inch tires. And I've upgraded my suspension to a comfort kit uh, suspension from Mountain Pass. You can check my one of my Tesla timeout videos from about two years ago to see my upgrade because I do find the Model 3 and the Model Y, the suspensions are still too harsh, even with the comfort level of suspension that Tesla's upgraded to. But you're paying here. This is a vehicle that's priced right in line with that. They are neck and neck in the price points. And I can tell you that the ride quality and the suspension is just fantastic compared to the, the Model 3. They're both planted. They both take turns really nice. These are running Pirelli tires on them, really good sticky uh, yet good low uh, roll resistant tires. So they've done a good job, Hyundai and the Ionic 6, in that ride suspension and handling capability. And on that note, you know, we could talk about build quality. Tesla has gotten much better, right? There's no doubt about that. The cars coming off the line are much better build qualities today. But still, the doors on here thunk a little nicer. The materials seem a little just a little thicker, a little put more put together. Maybe it's because the, the minimalistic interior kind of throws it off and gives this perception that the interior might not be as good. You know, I haven't had any issues in my Model 3 with, with fit and finish in the interior with squeaks and rattles. Yeah, some panel gaps and some little bit misalignment when you look at the doors and stuff. Here, everything is straight and pretty well flush. And you would expect that with, with the South Koreans and Hyundai, of course, in their quality and, and what they've been able to do. So that's going to be a bit of a hit and miss. You know, you can, you can get lemons any time of the, the day if you're buying a car. So sometimes you'll get one. But overall, you know, I think Hyundai's are building very, very nice high quality cars and they will continue to do so. And last thing I want to mention is Tesla's app, you know, the app. So I showed you uh, how the Hyundai app uh, is there. It's much better than it used to be. I remember looking at the app a couple of years ago and it was pretty bad. Now the response time is pretty good. It finds the car fairly quickly. You can do some basic stuff. It's not though nowhere as in depth as Tesla's app, especially for things like service and, and all the, the tweaks that they've added to there, things that you could do within the app. There's a lot that you can do where you can't do it all in the Hyundai uh, Blue Link app, but it's a good app and they've come a long way and I just suspect they'll get better and better with that. So to summarize, this is a long video because I've added that extra, you know, the first part from the old show. But, you know, for, for you folks that are watching this for the first time and didn't see my last show, I wanted to give you a lot of the information from there that's relevant, but of course, update it with this, the, the time that I've been able to spend with this vehicle over the last few weeks. So, you know, in summary, these are really good vehicles. Hyundai's done a great job. They are targeting this against the Model 3. That's why I'm, I've got this car in the background here, because this is what they're going after is that space. It's 
probably the number one or number two EV worldwide. Hard to say because the Model Y has picked up steam and, and Tesla doesn't break down Y in three sales, they group them together. But we suspect that the Model Y is now Tesla's number one seller, so the Model 3 being second. So these guys recognize that there's a market space for it and Hyundai is going after it and they've done a great job in the Ionic 6. Pricing is the same, right? If you buy the single motor Ionic 6, you'll get 100 kilometers more range than you will on the single motor Model 3, right? They have more range for the same price point, right? They're both just starting under 55K. They both top out on the Model 3 in the long range version, not the performance, but the long range, tops out at just under 65 Canadian. Same with this one, this is a 64 and change Canadian, fully spec'd out, fully loaded model. So they are pricing at par. Both models qualify for the Canadian 5K, which is good. Um, all the Model 3s now qualify for the 7,500 US Fed tax credit. That's new, so that's good. And I suspect that all the, that the Onyx will qualify for some of the tax credit, but you'll have to check on that. Remember, you get some extras with this car too. You get vehicle to load technology, right? So you can, you have a plug in the back seat, plug a laptop in, there's a, a 120, 110 volt, or you can use the adapter that comes with the vehicle, put an extension cord and use it for camping or put some lights on. I just, again, I 100% recommend this vehicle. I love my Model 3, I love what Tesla's done, but if you're looking for something that's close to the Model 3 and you're not into Tesla, then this is the one that you should look at. This is a fantastic vehicle for the same class, the four-door sedan, and this one does it all in spades. So my hat's off again to Hyundai. I hope you enjoyed this comparison, and if you have further questions, please feel free. All my contact information is coming up, so you can email me. So again, I wanna thank Hyundai Canada for uh, the uh, great use of this vehicle. Again, I've never ha had a press vehicle for more for uh, the amount of time that I've had this one. It's been a joy to drive around. Uh, just fantastic vehicle to drive. Love, love, loved it. If I had this All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Rev Show. Boy, I'm out of breath. Did a lot of talking. It's a lot, of, a lot of stuff I wanted to say about this vehicle, and I hope, again, it was very pertinent. Thanks very much for tuning in. All my details are coming up at the end of the show. You know, Patreon supporters, I always recognize you at the end of each show. You know who you are. But all that information is coming up. So, again, thanks very much for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And everybody stay safe. And until the next show, I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.